there's, um, I think there's quite a lot of unrealistic expectations about how easy AI is going to be and how quickly it's going to take before machines are as capable as us. It's not going to take a decade, I can promise you that. Someone, I spent my whole life trying to build intelligent machines, and it's a very challenging task. This is a towel-folding robot developed by some colleagues of mine at the University of California at Berkeley. Now, before you get all excited that this is the solution to your teenage children dropping towels on the floor, this guy takes 25 minutes to fold a towel. <laughs> People underestimate what millions, not thousands of years, millions of years of evolution have compiled into our motor skills and our intelligence. It's not something that's going to happen in the next 10 decades. But if we pick, if we narrow the focus, if we constrain the problem, sure enough, go to a car factory today, you'll find it's the robots that are doing the painting and the welding. We've made it a much more con constrained problem, uh, and it's worth putting in a very expensive robot to do that. Uh, and those jobs are never coming back. We're never going to be welding cars and painting cars. Well, actually, in Australia, we're never going to be. We've, all those jobs are already gone anyway. But we're ne they're never coming back to Australia equally. If you go to the new Amazon warehouse or the new Coles warehouse, it's going to be the robots that go and collect the, the objects. Uh, and you go to our ports and mines, we have some of the most automated ports on the planet. We have some of the most automated mines on the planet. Um, and that's been very good for Australia's GDP, improving the productivity uh, of those vital industries. And so, not surprisingly, lots of people um, are asking, I think, this, this very important question. Um, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about the question as to whether robots are going to take over our jobs and how, what sort of time scale that's going to be. Uh, probably the biggest misconception is amongst economists. Here's one of the most famous economists talking about uh, technological unemployment that's going to be haunting us very soon. Some of you may recognize this quote. This, of course, was John Maynard Keynes in 1930. And like all economists, he was wrong because we haven't had massive technological unemployment since 1930. In fact, the world's population is historical high levels, and unemployment around the planet is pretty much at the lowest level it's ever been. So lots of jobs have been created to replace those jobs that did get automated, um, and that's likely to carry on for a bit further. But you know, here's another person, the chief economist of the Bank of England. Well, actually, no, no one in England knows anything these days anymore. Just look at the disaster that's happening right there. But you would have hoped he would know something about work and his prediction here that half of all jobs were at risk. We really don't know what the, the, the risk is, what the numbers are going to be. I've looked closely at some of the data. So one of the most famous studies was a report in 2013 out of the University of Oxford, Frey and Osborne. Everyone quotes this report, 47% of jobs at risk of automation. Now, one of the things that people don't normally point out is that they use machine learning to make this prediction. So the job of predicting the jobs to be automated has already been automated. Certain irony to that. But if you look at the data, and I'm a scientist, so I go, go and look at closely the data, look at the predictions the economists are making, and some of them are just plain wrong. So this is one of the predictions with 98% with confidence that the job of bicycle repair person is going to be automated in the next two decades. Now, I can give you three good reasons why this prediction is completely false. First of all, I've gone and asked all of my colleagues, other people working in AI and robotics, everywhere around the world. No one, I, so far as I can tell, is trying to build a bicycle repair robot. Secondly, anyone who's repaired a bicycle will know it's a very difficult, fiddly job. And bicycle repair people are not very well paid. We're not going to, it's going to require a very expensive robot. And it doesn't make economic sense to build a very expensive robot to replace a very, unfortunately, lowly paid person. And thirdly, I mentioned this to a friend of mine who owns a bicycle shop. And she said, well, Toby, we actually lose money repairing bicycles. I said, well, so why do you bother then? And she says, well, it's to get people in the shop. It's to have a conversation with them. It's to talk about the latest cycle routes, the latest kit, and eventually to sell them a new bicycle. We're social animals, and we're going to get, uh, we won't want robots to do that. We want to do that with other people. Here's another prediction uh, that with high confidence, 95% probability, that the model is going to be replaced. 
Now, we can build a robot that would walk down a catwalk. Now, I don't think we can build a robot that can walk in high heels, but we could walk down the, we could walk down the catwalk. But frankly, we don't care what robots look like in clothes. <laughs> Here's another one that was mentioned actually this morning. Um, airline pilot. Now, I don't think actually we've got quite, if you the disaster with 737 MAX and so on, we haven't quite got to the point where we can completely trust um, the planes with our lives. But even when we do get to that point, I think we've decided as a society that we quite like the idea of having someone else whose life also depends upon the successful landing of this plane. <laughs> and even if there's nothing they can do, that at least they're trying their best up front. <laughs> so I don't see us replacing airline pilots anytime soon. Oh, and here's another one, again, with a high probability, which is um, sporting umpire. Now, it's true, we do have things like Hawkeye that can do actually a much more precise, much more accurate job than humans. But we're still going to have human judges that actually give us that. And in fact, the number of umpires is only set to increase by 11% over the next few decades, according to US employment statistics. So there's lots of things that we will, won't choose to automate or will be too difficult to automate or will be too too cheap to automate it, that we won't automate. But it's clear that there will be some jobs that change. Um, take Uber, right? Uber is already developing autonomous taxis. Um, they want to scale like every other internet business. The most expensive thing in an Uber is the person up front who's driving you. Um, it will be great news for most of us because the price of Ubers will plummet once they can get that expensive person out of the Uber. But that's bad news for Uber drivers because 20 years time, I see it very unlikely that almost anyone's going to be earning their living driving, whether it's a taxi or a, or a truck. Actually, I, do, I have made one prediction. There will be, you know, there's all these different flavors of Uber, you know, UberX, Uber Pool, Uber Eats. There'll be an Uber chauffeur where you can pay extra money to have someone who carries your bag to the door and opens the door and then has a conversation with you whilst the robot drives you. Uh, and of course, um, you know, if we, if we um, uh, look at uh, our airports or our supermarkets or our banks, we can already see uh, these are robots uh, that are weighing your bags for you and, and sending them on their way. And there used to be a line of people employed to do those jobs, and those people aren't going to be employed. And it's not clear that those jobs are ever coming back again. Of course. In trying to work out what's going to happen, you have to also factor in all the jobs that are going to be created. 20 years ago, no one was earning a living writing smartphone apps because the smartphone is only 20 years old. 20 years ago, no one was earning any money as a social media influencer because we hadn't invented social media. So all of those jobs get created 20 years time. Who knows what people will be doing because who knows what technologies will have been invented in 10 years time. And also, you have to factor in all the changing demographics on the planet and everything else, the fact that the working week might be getting shorter. In New Zealand and the UK, there's a couple of, country, couple of companies trialing a four-day week and discovering, surprisingly, people are just as productive in four days of work as they are in five and happier. So there's a huge amount of uncertainty, and don't believe what anything the economists tell you. That's a very good rule for anything that, about economists. We really don't know what the balance is going to be. I mean, it is just because in historically more jobs were created in the past than were destroyed does not mean that that's always going to be the same moving forwards. But I think that we can say with pretty great confidence that there is one certainty, though, is whatever new jobs do get created that people will have to transition into, they will require different skills than the old jobs. And so the important conversation is not, will a robot take my job, but how do we support people through the transition to the new jobs that we'll create? What sticks and carrots do governments provide? How do corporations help their employees so that we can transition through this period uh, and come out with it um, better, as we did in the first Industrial Revolution? And this is something that's already happening today. It doesn't take artificial general intelligence. It doesn't require us to do anything more with the machines than we can already do with many of our machines. The stupid intelligence we already have is enough to do many of the dull, dangerous, and repetitive jobs in our lives. And you can see this happening today. So at the end of last year, NAB 
one of our biggest banks, announced record profits and at the same time announced that they were going to lay off 6,000 members of staff and hire 2,000 new people with the appropriate digital skills. But this is something that's already happening today. It doesn't require us to invent any more smarter intelligence than we can already have, the limited intelligence we already have in our machines. And so that's the conversation we should be having, is how do we, how do we as individuals take responsibility for educating ourselves throughout our lives? Because you read the studies, it suggested that young people today will have 13 different careers, uh, 13 different types of job in the course of their career. And so how do we support people through these transitions? How do corporations support these people? You know, NAB was letting people down by at least 2,000 people down. They didn't have to hire, fire 2,000 people if they were going to hire 2,000 new people. So how do we give, make sure people have the right skills for the jobs in the future? And what are those right skills? It's not just digital skills, of course. If you have good digital skills, that would probably be a, a useful employment for your employment. But there are lots of other things, the emotional intelligence, the social intelligence, the creativity, the adaptability, uh, all those human skills, the very things that machines, the creativity, the things that machines are very... Uh, very limited in today and likely to be very limited in for, for a long time going forward. Those are the things uh, where we're going to want humans to do, where machines are going to do them very well, uh, and where the opportunities are for us to be more human. Uh, and finally, if, if you want to know more, I encourage you to take a look at my new book. Uh, it's called 2062 because I surveyed 300 of my colleagues and that's when they thought machines would be as capable as humans, still 40-odd years away. Thank you very much. <laughs>